morning, church. Good to see you. Happy Advent. All right. I'm going to put a question up on the screen here, and I want you to tell me, if someone were to come up to you and ask you this question, how would you answer this right here? Where do you find your hope? Where do you find it? There we go. All right. Good answer. Right? See, how you answer this one question affects everything. Everything. Especially during crazy season. I mean Christmas season. When everybody seems to be losing their minds in the lines, in the stores, in the drive through at Zaxby's. We'll just leave it there. The question this morning, we're going to come back to it, and we're going to ask this at the very end. Advent addresses this beautifully. We are going to journey together toward Christmas. And Advent, the thing I love about it is it is a time that forces us to slow down. It is a time to pause, to breathe deeply, to turn our eyes to the true meaning of the season, and that is the Savior. All right? Remember, this is Potter's hand, so you can be safe here. You don't have to pretend. You know as well as I do, it is so easy to get lost in the hustle and bustle. It is so easy to get caught up in all the comings and goings and the hectic and the hoopla and all the bigger and better sales and lights and all this stuff. We all have that one neighbor, right, who takes it to a whole new level. Like, they literally make it a competition. You know what I'm talking about? Come to my neighborhood. You will see. In fact, some people in our neighborhood, they've just given up. They know they're not going to compete. They just put up the ditto sign in their yard. Just want like, what he said, right? This is not an uncommon thing. If you Google this, you'll see this is happening everywhere. Just, I'm not even going to try. Whatever he said with his lights, that's what I'm going to do. Advent forces us to escape that. It forces us to slow down and really bask in the real meaning of the Savior. Now, you may only know Advent from a calendar where you just kind of have these little paper things, or maybe in our house we have this little thing, which has got a little, little goodie in here. Oh, say a number. 23. Oh, you get a treat. I did? Oh, yeah. Really? It's from 2018. But, <laughs> you know what, here, I'll let you, I'll let you play with it. See, this is, this is what we think of Advent. But what if I told you it is so much more than that? It's even more than the Evergreen Reef, which in just a second we're going to have our special guest come up and help me light that. The reason that they chose this Evergreen Reef is because it's circular. And the evergreen vows represent God's unending love. And it's just like your wedding band, when the, when the minister says, the vows you are taking, may they never end, like the endless circle. You can travel in it forever and never find its end. And then we have these four candles, which we light, one for each Sunday leading up to Christmas Eve. And this Christmas, we are starting this new series for Advent to get us focused called The Promise. And I'm so, so excited because this is a journey where we are going to discover and be reminded we serve a God who keeps his promises. We serve a God who honors his promises. And these promises are going to give us hope, peace, love, and joy. That's the theme. That's what Jesus brings when he shows up. All right, so as we celebrate with our own Advent wreath, let me have our volunteer come up. We're going to light this candle, get this party started the right way. Is it, uh, is it Ellie? Ellie, do you want to come up and be my helper? Yes? Okay. All right. We'll get a picture of this. Mom, Dad, you're allowed to take a photo if you want. You can come up here if you want. Ellie is going to have a new baby brother soon. Is that right? Are you excited? Are you excited to give him your bedroom? Yeah? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Did you really? I nailed it. That's awesome. All right. We're going to light this. This is the candle of hope this morning. Yeah, try it one more time. You got to pull it. Keep it together. Good job. Keep clicking until you see the flame. There you go. Nice. Good job. All right, I'll take that back. Thank you. Each week, we'll light a new candle, bringing us closer to Christmas Eve, where it'll culminate. You'll see the white candle show up, and that is remembering the Savior. We lean into the anticipation. Anybody remember as a child when you were anticipating Christmas, and you made these goofy rings, and you all had them? Like, they seemed like they were a mile long, because... This was like your old school countdown clock. And every time you tore one off, it's like two more grew in its place. Like, you're like, what witchcraft is this? Will Christmas ever get here? And you're so anticipating. And like grandparents would send presents in the mail and they'd put them under the tree, like just to torment you. They'd send them on like December 2nd 
And you'd walk by those, you'd see those friends, like, can I open it? And you'd shake it, you know, and you weigh it, and you sniff it. No, it's not cookies, all right, what is it? It's not jello mold. What is it? And you're shaking it, and you're weighing it, and you're thinking, what life-changing gift awaits me? And you have that anticipation. And man, you can forget trying to sleep. As a kid, that's about as lucky as you get in your skinny jeans come January 1st. It's not going to happen. That was the anticipation. That's kind of the magic of Christmas. The anticipating leading up to the holidays is almost as much fun as the day itself. But the truth is, and we talked about this all last month in our wilderness series, waiting is not fun and waiting is not easy. And none of us enjoy being in God's waiting room. But what if I told you waiting is what will make this Christmas better than any other one? What if I told you if you lean into this Advent season and you bask in the heart of waiting for him, you will find something so much deeper than presents under the tree, and holiday cheer. Usually when we research this, I love to share some deep revelatory word out of the Hebrew or the Koine Greek. But today, I have a special treat. Today, I get to share with you a Latin word. I can tell you're excited about that. I know I was, but I found it. The word Adventus is where we get the word Advent. And it talks about these four Sundays leading up to the big day. It literally means to wait on the arrival. The coming is happening. And today we look at the theme of hope. And hope is a word that we use a lot during Christmas. I hope I get what I want for Christmas, right? I hope it snows. I hope Pastor Matt turns the heat on in the worship center. I hope Cousin Eddie doesn't overcook the turkey this year. We have all these things that we hope for, but they never happen. I think we have a photo of that. Do we have that photo? Oh, man, there's my buddy right there. Save me the net, Clark. <laughs> you know, here's the problem when we use hope like this. It cheapens the word. It takes the meaning out of it. In fact, if we're being honest, what we mean when we say hope is I wish. And that relegates hope to wishful thinking. But hope, in the biblical sense, is not wishful thinking. It is so much more than that. In 1 Peter, we see this. He says, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Not only the first advent, which we're celebrating at Christmas, but the second advent. And I love how the message translation puts it. It says, so roll up your sleeves. I love that. Get your head in the game. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming. When Jesus arrives. So you know, I gotta ask, how ready are you? How ready are you? Not only to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus, but ready to see him return. Because we're gonna see the ancient prayer of Advent is actually a call to what is coming. Lord Jesus, when will you return? First Peter actually uses the, the term gird up your loins. Prepare your mind for action. Be sober-minded. Gird up the loins of your mind. What does that even mean? Loins? Like, like sirloin or pork loin? We, we, don't, we don't talk like that. But I think it was Pastor Bill or maybe Pastor Jason that, that talked just a few weeks ago. When, when the men went into battle, they had to take their long tunics that went all the way down their ankles and tuck them up and put them in their belt. Or they would trip. When a threatening thing came, they didn't have time to sit there and go, excuse me, can you hang on a second? They literally girded up their loins and made it ready for battle. They were focused. They were ready to spring into action. That means their future was now secure because of what they did in the present. And recognizing that our future is shaped by the present, we can have hope for both. And that's your first takeaway. If you're a note taker, here it is. Hope is a certainty about the future that impacts the present. Hope is a certainty about the future, but it's supposed to impact today, right? This is not just having hope for no reason. It's not just about well wishes or thoughts or positive vibes. Ooh, spirit fingers. I love that. You see these people, and bless their hearts, they mean well on social media. They're like, some tragedy happens, like sending positive vibes your way. What does that do? What does that even mean? Well, it's their heart doing the best they can without the Lord. I don't need positive vibes. I want you to intercede before the throne of the Father. Hope is a certainty about the future. Our hope is set in a specific moment in history. Jesus' birth, his death, his resurrection, all of that gives me hope. It's restructuring the way I look at the world right now. It changes. We talk about the perspective. It gives me a fresh perspective, not the craziness that I see all around and all the chaos, but it will be when Christ comes to set all things right. 
Right? So let me show you what hope looks like in a very small, very modern, simple example of what hope can look like. You all know this is my favorite season. I absolutely love fall. Fall is when the leaves change and all these beautiful colors happen and it's crisp and I don't have to wear like long, it's just, oh, I don't sweat as much, it's just awesome. There's just one problem I've noticed and that is all these beautiful leaves fall. And now that I have a yard that actually has trees, I don't like fall like I used to. I don't like the leaves. See, I know that everyone that falls has to be gathered and it's tedious boring, cold-inducing, and, and allergy-suffering, boring where leaves they get everywhere. And it's, it's awful. And every time I see a leaf fall, just a little tear falls with it, right? It's, and an angel loses its wings, right? It, just, it, it breaks your heart. It's, there's so much to be cleaned up. And today, I want to tell you, I have a flicker of hope. I have a flicker of hope because... My future reality is being reshaped by my present circumstance. And my hope is found in my son, who is now old enough to <laughs> clean the leaves, to do this, right? Yeah, he's, he was terribly excited. Can we zoom in and show the excitement? There it is. That's <laughs> so exciting. So, think about this, right? I am anticipating the day within the next week to 10 days that he will... <laughs> Boldly march into the front yard like a warrior that he is and vanquish those leaves. So I don't have to. Up until now, this has been me. All right, I'm going somewhere spiritual with it. This is, this is actually so cool, so deep. This year, my future hope is impacting me now. I am able to find joy and no longer stress or grief because I recognize my situation is about to change because of his actions, right? My hope for the future is impacting me now. And if you look in the scriptures, you will see every hero you look up to in the Christmas story had one thing in common. They were all full of hope. Every single one of them. And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Check out Isaiah 9-2. We see this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. What an awesome promise. And the Old Testament was full of promises and prophecies like this about the coming of Jesus. And each one would sustain the Jewish people. How? Because they knew rescue was coming. They knew hope was on the way. How about you? With the struggle you're facing with your family, with your work dilemma, with your health scares, do you know that hope is there? Do you know that hope is on the way? Think about this. this I, I, we... Probably the best example I can find in all of the scriptures about the Advent hope is the man named Simeon. A perfect example of this. He oriented his entire life around a future promise given to him by God. In fact, he would probably make that verse his central prayer because he knew the scriptures from the Old Testament. Simeon was an old man. If you're not aware of the story, Mary and Joseph had the baby Jesus and they took him to the temple to be dedicated and consecrated. It was a very traditional Jewish ceremony. And then they showed up, Simeon was there. Check out what happens next. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout and looking forward to Israel's consolation. Remember that word, we'll come back to it. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. All right, for the younglings in here, if you're not sure what that... God is literally giving a promise. You won't die until I show you the Messiah. Can you imagine that promise? Think about it. Verse 27. So guided by the Spirit, Simeon enters the temple. When the parents, this is Jesus' parents, bring the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms. I love this. I've got an actual baby here to show you. It's not an actual baby, just so you know. <laughs> Took him up in his arms to perform it. Simeon took him up, praised God, and said, verse 29, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared it in the presence of all the people, in light of revelation for the Gentiles and the glory to your people Israel. And his mom and dad were amazed at what was being said about the baby. Man, I bet they were. Think about it. They walk up to the temple, and this old man, some say he was 
112 years old when you look at the Jewish tradition. 112 years old. And this old man comes up and says, thank you, may I have your child? Can you imagine? And he takes it, and then he says the most marvelous prayer. He holds up the baby and he says, now, Lord, I can depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now imagine being mom and dad standing right here watching this go down. And Simeon, a total stranger, they might have known who he was because he was a righteous man. He probably had a great reputation. And he's holding the anointed one. Imagine the promise he had up until this moment. You will not die until this moment happens. You think he was like bold? Like, I could go step out in front of a truck because I ain't going to die. Right? Because you know the young kids thinking that. Like, oh, how can I jump off? I mean, how far does this promise go? And now Simeon's holding the baby. And the promise has been fulfilled. What's he thinking? Am I going to die? <laughs> is this it? Think of what was going through his mind, and he's holding it. None of that matters. All he knows is, I have seen my Savior. The Redeemer is here. The one he had hoped for for 100 plus years, he's here. Remember, he'd been through all the painful times in Israel's history. He'd seen the Romans come and conquer and occupy his people. He'd seen civil war after civil war. He'd seen bloodshed. He'd seen all their hopes crushed. And in the midst of all these difficult moments, Simeon holds out hope. Because he knew God wasn't done. He knew he would honor his promise, and he wouldn't quit. And in Luke 2, Simeon stands in the temple, and he holds the Messiah, the one through whom the whole world would be redeemed. He says, my eyes have seen salvation. Can you picture it? Can you grasp that? The people were crying out. They were groaning. How long, O oh Lord? How long must we wait? And that's our second truth this morning. Hope is birthed out of that pain. Hope is birthed out of a longing, a deep longing, and, and these, these desires, this, this desperate need that we are humbly able to admit. How about you? Have you come to the point where you can admit we need a Savior, where we need God's presence, His comfort? Luke tells us that Simeon was waiting in the temple for something very specific, the consolation of Israel. You know what that word means? It literally means the comfort, the deep encouragement. I'm not talking about like an attaboy, like woo, and some nice words. This is a reference to a gut level, deep longing that he comes in comforts. Remember Isaiah? For hundreds of years, Israel had been defeated and destroyed. Nation after nation had come and beat up on them. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, you've seen the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians. Even Auburn was able to beat Israel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too soon? All right, just let me, I'm going to step out of the pulpit. I'm going to say something here. <laughs> let me have this moment. Because we all know next week, Bama's going to lose. Okay? I'm just going to admit it. I'm already wearing black. I'm already in mourning. Ryan Wisham, congratulations. You win next week. We'll just clear it out. So you don't have to come up and say, oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're not. No, you're not. You didn't congratulate me when they win. Don't tease me when they lose. <laughs> Everyone had beaten Israel. Everyone. People are coming and saying, hey, have hope. Cheer up, little, little camper. But that wasn't their circumstance. And they're looking around going, why? Why should I have hope? Look at this situation. You know why they had hope? Because they believed the promise. Do we? When you get that bad test, when you get that horrible news about a family member, when the job front, when the family dinners go sideways, we're so focused here, we don't pull back and see that eternal perspective, that one day, no matter what is happening, the God of hope and encouragement will come through, and he will make all things right. You know, I can't resist putting in a Greek word. The Greek word that he's using right here is prosdekamai. Prosdekamai. I love this word because it literally means to open up, to give full access to oneself, to accept. This is a, almost like a, a kind of, of waiting and acceptance that hurts. It's an awareness of a deep need for something. And Simeon had this, his expectancy. It was birthed out of his awareness of his need for God and for him to come and restore comfort and healing. And during these weeks leading up to Christmas, you are going to face that. I want to encourage you, allow yourself to take a breath, to feel your deep need, to feel that you have got to lean into God right now because there are so many people, be honest, that sense the need and they fill it with everything but Jesus. You probably got family members, friends, I do, that when they, they know that they're so close, but they stuff that need down with denial or 
or shopping or more things or more career accomplishments or more busy or more self-medication and self-soothing, right? You pick your poison. We know people who do that instead of leaning into the one source of hope. And while they technically may be alive, that is not really living. And the one who comes and offers hope is the only one that can change and restore. When we know the Prince of Peace, there's this ancient prayer. The ancient prayer of Advent comes from Scripture, and it's, Come, Lord Jesus. They were waiting for the original Messiah to show up. Come, Lord Jesus. Please deliver us. Where is our Redeemer? Do you sense their longing? Do you sense their pain? How ironic, how eerie, how perfectly fitting is it that the prayer for the second advent is almost identical. All the way back in the book of Revelation, it says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Some of you are hurting. Some of you got family members who are struggling. And it is tough. And you sense all is not right with the world. You sense in your core there is a redeemer that is coming to make all things right. Let me just pause and just ask a, a very, very serious question. How badly do you want that? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Do you know what that means? You're asking Adonai to return to redeem us, to make all things right, as he promised. How badly, Christian, do you really want that? Is that your heart's cry? Is that your longing? Or are we so in love with the world that we're kind of, be honest, we're kind of like, eh, if he comes back, that's okay. If not, I've got a great life. I've got things to do. Right? It shows where our perspective is. Or is the pain... And knowing what the world is supposed to be, and it will be again, is it so in front of you that you are heavenly minded and you say, no matter how great this world is, it pales in comparison with what's coming. This is a blip on the radar. Everybody look down at the carpet. Pick one little color, gray, black, chocolate, whatever that is in there. Just pick one little thing. That is our life. Now pull back two feet. That's a generation or two on each side of you. Now pull back all the way and take in all the carpet of the roof. That is your eternal life. You see the perspective? When you look at that, what are we focused on? Even so, come Lord Jesus. The great Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor, who was killed for his faith just moments before Hitler would be defeated. Just moments. One of the last things he said about Advent, he said, the only ones who can truly celebrate and feel Advent are the people who carry a restlessness with them, who look around and know this world is incomplete and there is something greater that is coming. Is that you? Think about that. Let this Advent season be so different than ever before. Don't allow yourself to take the easy route. Don't allow yourself to distract and to... Fill your life with other things and to self-soothe and self-medicate. Wrestle with the pain. Come face to face with the brokenness of the world and our own brokenness because that's only when we can embrace Christ and we see that this normal hustle and bustle isn't where it's at. We have to run to the Prince of Peace. That deep longing can only find comfort and hope in Jesus. Hope is found in that deep longing. And here's the great news because you know I will always bring you the good news. Hope is not the nebulous feeling that this world tries to sell you. It's not good cheer. It's not happy thoughts. It's not spirit fingers and good vibes. Hope is found in a person. And the person is Jesus. That is where our hope... Remember what First Peter told us right in the very beginning. Hope is not set on earthly wishful thinking. This is such good news because if it was, then our hope would be found here in the temporary. It would only be in our 401k or our 403b for you nonprofits. It would only be found in a good health report. It would only be found in our career advancement in a promotion. It would only be found in our kid kicking the winning soccer goal. Temporary things. But that's not what Jesus came for. This life he knew was a blip to what is to come. He would come, the promised arrival, the future, and restore all that is broken. Do you sense the brokenness? He will come and calm every fear and dry every tear. So let me ask you a question, speaking of fears. Is there anyone here brave enough to admit they have a fear of flying? 
Anybody? Yeah, yeah, I do. I don't like flying. I do not get in a hollow metal tube, go 400 miles an hour with a stranger at the wheel that I've never met. Not doing it. I mean, if I have to, I will. And if it's a small plane, oh, you can forget that. Ain't no way. I read this week, true story of a young man who was just completing his pilot's license. All right? And I thought about getting my pilot's license, a way to get over my fear, right? I don't like, don't like spiders, don't like being in tiny planes. And he had an amazing story. He worked so hard to earn his pilot's license. When he finally earned it, he was so proud, he couldn't wait to take his first passenger up in the air with him. And he knew exactly who he was going to ask. His hero. His father. He couldn't wait to take his dad up into the air. And so he writes, with my newly minted private, license, private pilot's license in hand, I had wanted my first non-instructor passenger to be my dad. I had this fantastic trip plan. I planned it long ago. We would take off, we would head north to Michigan. We would circle around Michigan State University, his home, and we would circle around and look at all the sites and maybe even get permission to land on the private runway at the university. Maybe grab a bite uh, to eat there at the local club and, and then get on the plane and then go see some of the Great Lakes. I had this beautiful trip planned, couldn't wait to do it until my dad spoke up. And I will never forget what my dad said more than 40 years ago, he remembers. The little Cessna had just cleared the pattern and had climbed to its first 1,500 feet platform when his dad looked over at him and said, okay, son, we can land now. <laughs> Literally 90 seconds into the flight, he looks over and says, okay, we can land now. Wait, what? Dad, I planned this huge trip. I've got all, the, all your favorites. We're going to go up. We're going we're gonna, to, it's going to be great. Why, why, why do we have to? He says, son, I've never had to tell you this, but I am terrified of flying. And what's worse, I really don't like small planes. In fact, I have no confidence in small planes. I have zero confidence in them. Dad, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me? Why would you even agree to come? And he looked at him and he said, because... I have confidence in you. I agreed to come with you because I wanted you to know that I trust you. I believe in you. And he overcame his fear, albeit temporarily, but he did something uncomfortable because he stepped out in faith and believed in his son. What about you? Do you believe in the son that way? Do you have that level of faith that you can say, I have total confidence? Even though the world's falling apart and it's risky, I have confidence in the Son. As we read through the New Testament, we see people after people who are around Jesus who don't get it. They don't realize they're in the presence of someone so significant. Isn't it strange that all the writings of the Old Testament point to Jesus? They point to the Messiah like, like giant stoplights blinking, but none of them got it? Only Simeon? Only Simeon shows up. He knew when he saw Jesus. Even at a few days old, he holds it up and says, this is the anointed one. This is the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. The one who's going to bring hope and peace and love and joy. Here he is. This is it. So let me ask you the question, the elephant in the room. Why did Simeon get it right when so many people got it wrong? Why was the majority wrong and the minority right? Could it be because everyone else was looking and expecting a Messiah that met their expectation and not what Jesus really was? See, they wanted a political warrior king to come in and overthrow those evil Roman oppressors and put the Jews back on top. Jesus grows up and they're looking at him like, uh, I don't think this is it. Uh, he's a helpless babe, he's got no army, he's got no money, he's... Some of his close friends are turning on him. And next thing you know, he's half naked on a cross, humbly sat. Who does that? That's not our Messiah. What is that? I mean, don't you see what we were looking for? God, you sent the wrong one. Think about how they had these expectations of what they wanted. The warrior king, you're going to come. You're going to make all things right according to my will. But Simeon didn't see that. Everyone else missed it, but Simeon had a different hope. See, when our hope is placed in anything other than God's promises, you will be disappointed. You will be frustrated. Why are we surprised by this? 
We look around shocked, like, oh, I can't believe it. It's a broken world. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we know in our gut level things need to be made right, and only the Messiah will do that. So this morning, in the midst of wherever you are, physically, spiritually, mentally, I want to ask you the question again that we started with. Where do you find your hope? Because how you answer this question changes everything. Whether you are rocked by every news report, whether you are shaken to your core by the latest thousand point dive on your stock portfolio, or the latest flavor of a virus, or the latest threat of war, where's your hope? Don't be, don't be fooled. The world is watching us. They want to see that we have peace in the middle of storms. Not because we're great, but because we walk with the Prince of Peace. So our hope's not out there. Our hope is in Him. And there is such a huge difference between being hopeful for something, which is the world, or being hopeful in something. Jesus. That is where our hope is found. That's why we're not rocked and blown to and fro by every news report, every wind of doctrine. During this Advent season, we acknowledge the deep longing because we know where our source of hope comes from. And we can live every moment believing the best is yet to come. See, when we begin to embrace the anticipation, the expectation, knowing not only was the first advent awesome because it changed the course of the universe, we know what is to come. It's an act of hope. We're actively waiting. We're not sitting around going, just come to Jesus. He's given us a mission. Let me, let me show you what I mean. I'm, I'm going to invite our, our instrumentals to come back up. And I want to show you this picture. Here's a young couple who is somewhat happy that they finally, after years and years of trying to become pregnant, did. I, I'm not sure if he's got joy or anxiety over here, but let's just assume they're both ecstatic. Now, here's the thing. They're so excited to be pregnant, they're finally coming, but now they realize they have nine long months to wait. And it feels like it takes forever, especially if you're the lady. It feels like it will never come, but all you can do is wait on the arrival for the child. But guess what? In the waiting, there is so much you can do to be prepared, oh, this is deep, for when he finally arrives. You got to paint the room. You got to put that crib together. You got to get some sleep. You got to decide which in-laws are coming, what time, how long they're staying, or not. You got to think through all these things. There's so much to do. you got to buy the clothes and baby-proof the house, all these things. See, when we have hope that Jesus is going to show up in our life, we find we have plenty to do to join him in his work. This is our mission now, to tell others about the Savior. It's not to keep the light to ourselves. It is active waiting. And the really good news is that baby, guess what? He already came. He's here. It's not just a, a one and done. I mean, now he's still alive. And that is my question for us. What is your response to him when he stands and he offers salvation? Do you reject it? Do you accept it? Do you walk in the hope or do you live in the world? Only you can make that decision. Let me pray for you. Would you bow right where you are? Father, in this moment, I know that there are some who may know about you but have never taken that step to know you as Savior and Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would tug at their heart, just like you tugged at mine, that 16-year-old scrawny kid in Ridgecrest, North Carolina. God, I pray that you would tug on each person's heart and reveal our need for you. Your word tells us if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord, we believe in a heart that you have raised him from the dead, that we would be saved. God, we confess our sin to you. More than confession, Lord, we repent. No easy believism here, God. We walk away from our sinful past. We invite you to be Lord of every room in our heart. Take full control. Holy Spirit, do a full renovation as only you can. Invade our soul. Take full control. Be our Lord. Be our Savior. Thank you that your shed blood on the cross took away my sin. We believe. We believe you are who you say you are that you died, you were buried, you were resurrected, and now you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me from my sin. Father, for those who are discouraged today, I pray your peace on them. For those who are hurting, I pray you would lift their burdens. 
such a tough, broken world, but God, I thank you that you've given us hope. That we can lean into you knowing this world as it is now is not our home. But you will make all things new. Your word tells us a new heaven and a new earth await those who know you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your family. We are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was the first time that you had that revelation of God. Based on the word of God, if you meant what you are praying to the Lord, you are a new creation. I would love to hear about it. Come tell me after church. We'll rejoice with you. Maybe today is the day when we open up the altar. We like to sing just one last song. Maybe it's a day to ask for forgiveness or to forgive somebody. Maybe that's what the Advent season is for you, to start fresh and new. Maybe it's a time to come and confess sin. Maybe it's a time to say, God, I'm, I'm all in. Maybe you've made that decision, but you've never been baptized. You want to follow through that. Come tell me. Maybe you want to pray for a lost family member. The altar will be open. No one will bother you. There's something special when in the quiet of the moment you kneel before the king. Whatever God's leading you to do, just be obedient. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. This is your time with the Savior. What is your response to him today?